Hello, my friend, and welcome to this episode of A Call to Leadership. I'm Dr. Nate Sala, your host. I'm so glad you are here. You know, when I was young, I had aspirations of becoming an entrepreneur. And this episode is all about those aspirations, how they become a reality. And perhaps for you, you might have already been down that road. And perhaps you're in a season now to where you're thinking about how do I turn the page from working for someone to becoming my own business owner? Well, this is the episode for you. When I was just a teenager, I had side hustles, street businesses. I had uh, a business that was, uh, my first business was a golf ball business. I was nine years old. We lived across the street from a golf course and golf balls will constantly land in the yard. I was tasked with mowing the grass. And back then we didn't have the fancy electric mower. We had a push mower that was all mechanical. We had a drum and you pushed as hard as you could and the blades would cut. Uh, it, was a, it was hard, hard work. Well, the golf balls would get stuck in the drum. So I take the golf balls out, put them in a cigar box, for some reason, cigar boxes were like plentiful back in the 70s and early 80s. And then I would take them across the street and wash them in the golf ball washers. And I'd sit at the tea station and I would ask golfers if they wanted to buy one for 15 cents or two for a quarter. And I would resell those balls. Well, that was great. And I made a little extra cash. All the other kids were selling lemonade and it was a congested market. I found, hey, I had unlimited supply of product at no cost to me, except for my time for preparing the product for resale. And I had ample customers at the golf course. And most of them didn't mind at all because it was a private course. And though they saw some kid there, they thought I was tenacious. Until one golfer came up and said, hey, that's my golf ball. And I had remember watching some kind of a legal show. And I said, well, sir, you know that possession is nine tenths of the law. <laughs> so he let me keep the golf ball. And that was my first taste of entrepreneurship. And though it was rudimentary and it was just a little bit, uh, I was like, man, this is so cool. I can pr just participate in capitalism. And it's so much more energizing to me than uh, than just uh, work. I, of course, I didn't know what it meant to work for someone at that point, but I would later. And this is an essential aspect, I believe, of the entrepreneurial journey is the sense of purpose that you get from, from providing a service or a product that is of your own design from your own hand and without the constraints or the boundaries of the of having to quote unquote answer to others except for your customers, of course. And if you're in a place to where you are excited about that and you find that there is great joy in paving your own way, having some independence there. Now you might say, well, Nate, that's just golf balls. It's a lot different when you get into a, an organization. Absolutely. That's just the taste. That's just the beginning. In fact, Later, I started other businesses. One was a street hustle where I was selling bootleg cassette tapes at the local flea market. But I was tenacious. I would get up at five, six in the morning on the weekend, get myself a good spot because you had to get up really early to get a good spot, show up. In fact, I was probably getting up earlier because I had to show up at six and claim your space, pay your fee and start selling your, your product, your goods. And that's another aspect of entrepreneurship I think that people need to recognize is that there is a discipline that is essential to successful entrepreneurship. When I see entrepreneurs, and don't get me wrong, you say, Nate, well, I don't know if I want to get up that early. That's totally fine. But if you need to get up that early to get a good location so that you can sell your product effectively and you don't, you likely won't sell your product effectively. You've got to measure that out and make sure that you're in a place where your business needs are met by the individuals who are a part of the business. You say, Nate, well, what if I hire people who are early risers to go to that flea market and set up camp? Absolutely. You can do that. 
That's the other thing about being a business owner is that you've got to find out where your drives are. You've got to find out where your strengths lie and your motivations lie. And so if you're not extra, you don't have a high level of extroversion and you're in a sales environment, well, you might find that it's better to hire someone who's strong in sales and you work in a different area that is in your individual drive. You may have a high technical skill in a different area altogether. In fact, I have a client who has a business and they are they have a high level of extroversion and a great ability to to sell and to close a sale and they don't do any of the technical work of fulfilling the contract. So this is interesting because this is a niche for this individual. This individual has hired highly technically achievable people. And now this person runs the funnel. So the business owner simply closes the sale. Of course, there's other aspects of the business as well, some administrative functions and whatnot. However, uh, extremely successful at, at the business. It's going wonderfully and bringing on great people to fulfill the, 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 the service offerings. So you as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as a potential business owner, where are your strengths? Are they in a technical skill? Say, for example, you want to be in the health and well wellness business. Say you want to help people with their physical health. And you know, man, I am really good at motivating people to achieve their, uh, their goals. And I'm really good at staying in the trenches with them. They feel fulfilled and compelled to get the the uh, exercising done. I can teach them about physiology and diet. However, you may say that I'm just not good at getting people in the door. I'm not good at the awareness piece, the marketing, the advertising piece. So don't try to do that. Say, Nate, I, I can't afford to have anyone else do it. You need to start building in the budget so that you can create that. Now you say there's a possibility that you may actually at the early stages have to do that. You're right. You may have to be the word of mouth as well and convince people about your great services. And that might be a, necess a necessity. But as you grow, recognize that that's just not my skill set. It's not my strength. I just want to be there to do my work and show up and have the clients ready for me. That's a possibility because then you can bring in social media teams. You can bring in others and to help you. In fact, it doesn't cost that much these days to get a social media team going and to start getting you uh, leads and ads and let them do their best work. In fact, my one of my favorite quotes that uh, regarding this is, uh, do your best, uh, uh, do what you do best, and outsource the rest. So when you do what you do best, and then you allow others to do what they do best, that's how the organization begins to thrive. So if you don't have a strong background in putting the business together, hire somebody to do that. Hire an accountant, hire an attorney. And these are, an, an accountant and an attorney are really important, especially as you're starting a business. But before you even get there, it's so important to recognize who can I learn from? Now, I've found this, and this isn't the only way to do business, but I've found that sitting at the feet of those who have accomplished where I want to go, whether it's in mentorship or whether it's in a business environment, uh, has tremendous market value. So, if you're in a situation to where you want to, and let's just continue with that uh, uh, exercise and health and wellness example. If you want to run your own uh, gym, or if you want to simply be a personal trainer, spend some time in a gym as an employee. Spend some time listening and reading audio books or, or reading books by those who have been in that field and consume. You, know, you must be a discoverer. We must be discoverers before we're influencers, before we're achievers. This is the, 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 the formula, if you will, that, that I believe leadership thrives, where leadership is first discovery, then it's influence, then it's achievement, and it's all wrapped around shared purpose. So if you want to be an effective leader, then you must be, first be an effective discoverer. You must first be an ex effective explorer. So don't go out and discover on your own. Discover with others. Discover what others have already found. Because if you go work in that gym, you might find, wow, they do this great. This 
they can improve upon. So you start taking your notes in your playbook and you learn about the habits and the behaviors and all the pieces because you're going to school. At that point, this is your education. The beauty of it is you get paid to be educated if you are an employee. And sometimes you're not paid to be educated. Sometimes you're learning by observation. You're learning by looking at the marketplace and the context. Walt Disney did this before he even opened his park, Disneyland. He would go to these amusement parks and just sit on a bench and watch and watch people going in and out of these, of these places, these, these amusement parks. He would look at the concession stand, see how long people took to wait for food, take notes, talk with people. And he began to assemble uh, empirically much data on how he was going to change and make it different. In fact, his wife said, why would you even want to open an amusement park? Now, granted, remember, this guy is a, a movie and TV guy. So he is an entertainment guy. And of course, amusement parks is a form of entertainment, but it's still diversification. And he was, he was on a track. He was, you know, he was well known. He had, he had lots of awards and uh was 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 known around the world for that and his wife's like you know you're gonna throw it all away by opening an amusement park and his mindset was my amusement park will be different it's going to be so engaging it's going to be a movie in 3d for people to participate in but he couldn't ever have the possibility of making that happen had he not been doing his research he did it locally at his, in his community, he even went overseas, Tivoli Gardens. I believe that's in Denmark. He went to those gardens and he walked around with friends and saw all the open air and the rides and the food. and thought, wow, okay, I can build on this. This is a plus for me. This adds to my playbook on what I would do. Back here in the U.S., he saw some very seedy, if you will, amusement parks that he wouldn't even bring his kids to. And he took his notes. Okay, this is not kid-friendly. This is not family friendly. I want something that the whole family can enjoy together and make memories that last a lifetime. He wouldn't be able to do that had he not been observing this through his own, uh, through his own homework. You've got to do the same thing. I've got to do the same thing. As a leader, we both must have the mindset of insatiable curiosity. That insatiable curiosity means that I want to be in the mix so that I'm creative, so that I can gather more and more and more data to help me to form a vision of the future that is attractive, that's worthwhile, that is achievable. And so the, the, the hallmark of you being an effective leader, one of them, is your, your desire to learn. And your desire to learn doesn't end when you reach a plateau or a milestone, it is nonstop. I've been learning my entire life, even after all of the education and the degrees. It's not even an if then. It is always learning, learning. And that's what you're doing now by just listening or watching this podcast is that you're learning because when we can learn, then we have more to grow with. And if we have more to grow with, then we have more to give. And so that was it for me as well. I worked in my cousin's check cashing money order booth when I was 19 years old. So the golf ball business was done. I did some work at uh, Chuck E. Cheese's. As you, if you've been listening, you've probably heard me tell that story. And then I had a small stint at a pizza place, Pizza Hut, delivering pizzas. And then my cousin said, hey, you can come work for me. So he sold, uh, sold money orders and check cashing and lottery and even some jewelry. He did taxes too. So it was just kind of a one-stop shop, little bulletproof glass uh, shop inside of a strip mall. And I became an apprentice. So I learned the trade, different aspects of it. And within a couple of years, I was running the business for him. And I thought, wow, okay, well, I can go out and do this on my own now because I've mastered the, some, several aspects of the trade, not all of them, because there were many things that I hadn't been taught. I had to learn on my own. However, I understood the technical skills of the service offering. And so I started scouting out for an, a location for myself because that's what I was intending to do. I was ready to be an entrepreneur. I was 21 years old. 
and I was actually dropping out of college. I had uh, I, I just about got, I got my associate's degree, and I was done with college. And from there, it was going to be, hey, you're going to be a rich entrepreneur, right? I had dollar signs in my eyes. Well, being a rich entrepreneur is not nearly as easy as I had thought it would be. But I was ready to go. And I told my cousin, I'm going to go open my own location. And he actually says, he surprised me. He said, hey, why don't you just buy my business? I'm ready to get out and you can take it over. And I said, I don't have any money. Not sure I'm going to do that at age 21. So I requisitioned my mom, uh, who was so gracious, and my other cousin, who was also so gracious, to lend me the seed money to purchase this business. Of course, I needed working capital as well. And uh, I was off to the races. Uh, it was February 5th, 1995, 21 years old, and I was in business for myself. And boy, let me tell you, I felt great. Hired my buddy, but I did nothing well. I understood the mechanics of the some of the aspects of the sales model. I knew who my customers were, but everything else, operations, finance, the human resources component, much of that had to be learned. So from 95 to 98, and I was like dropping the ball everywhere. I was spending money I didn't have. Because I wanted to be Mr. Uh, Mr. The Man. So I bought fancy cars. I had a Corvette. I had a BMW. I had a motorcycle. I was taking buddies out. I had my, a nice place. The re- what I didn't realize was is that I was hemorrhaging cash. I was using borrowed money to fund that business. Because one thing I didn't learn during my tenure was financial management. And so if I were to be able to go back and do it again, during that time when I was sitting in that check cashing booth, instead of just reading Men's Health Magazine, which was, it was important, but I didn't need to read every single episode or every single magazine cover. I would have been looking at how to run a business, how to look at the financial model, how to look at the operational model. I would have bought books on business planning 101. And I would have, I would have done that. Why? It would have helped me tremendously. I was, by the time I was, uh, by 1998, I was already $100,000 in debt. So I was basically uh, $1.1 million away from being a millionaire. So I was going the wrong direction. I was so stressed out. I was developing ulcers. I just had this huge weight on my shoulder. And you say, okay, well, isn't that part of the experience? Yes, it can be. But no, it doesn't have to always be. There's going to be stresses in business. However, I now know the power of education. I now know the power of learning. And I should have asked my mentor, my the business owner at the time, my cousin, hey, I understand how to cash a check or do a money order or lottery and all that. But teach me how to understand the finance of this business. Teach me how to understand the profit and loss statement. How to understand the balance sheet. (coughs) How to understand the ways that I can build a healthy business. And so I did, I had to learn that, that the hard way, the school of hard knocks and you as well, you might find that, boy, there's a business model that's super enticing. I would strongly encourage you before going out on your own, take a course, watch a seminar, do an online uh, webinar, Uh, get involved with understanding the main principles of your business. I teach a class on business. Uh, I've taught one, and one's called Introduct- Introduction to Entrepreneurship, which is at uh, one of the universities I teach. One was called Business Policy. And essentially, business policy was creating a business plan. And the students were mostly business people. <coughs> Excuse me. Business people who worked in companies. And Throughout the program, the, the program that they were in, which was a, earning a bachelor's of business administration, as they moved through the program, they were critical generally of their companies in terms of what they did and didn't do right because they, they read these books for, about advertising and marketing and HR and, and operations and how to manage a company effectively and so on. And they found, wow, our companies could be doing a lot better. And then they got to the business planning 
course, the, the capstone course, we call it, or the last class. And in this class, they went from understanding how to put a business plan together and putting their own plan together for a hypothetical business. Some of them wanted to actually open these businesses, whether it was a, a soap bar company or a, a, a sewer company or many, many different ideas. And I love these ideas as an instructor and helping people to form these ideas. And, and, and it was fun, fun class. However, I noticed something that, that was a thread that ran through most of these courses. Every time I taught it, the students, many of the students began to express humility. They stopped thinking, oh my goodness, yeah, these companies can um, really botch it up to, man, I'm just so thankful I get a paycheck because this is hard. It's hard on paper. Most of the students, by the time they got to the financial section, realized that they were upside down financially, near bankruptcy. And we had to make some major changes to their financial model. They didn't know how to run a business. On paper, they would have been out of business pretty quickly. And just imagine that. So this is on paper, and some of these students still thought, boy, I, I might still try to open this business. But most of them thought, it's just good to stay where I am, working for a company. And the, the reality is that these individuals possibly could have opened a business. However, now they are armed with better data, better information, more education, more learning to know what is the best and highest use of their time. And so for you, I would encourage you the same thing. And even if you've been in business, it doesn't hurt. It can certainly even help to go through a business planning process, a refresh for your own business. You can do this online. You can do this through YouTube. You can do this through a number of different methods and means. And even just listen to podcasts. Uh, there's many, of many, many, many of my colleagues who, who do this uh, in terms of teaching courses on Business 101. In fact, we're going to have one pretty soon as well. But there's no greater opportunity, if you will, than the opportunity to learn from others. That is the heart of this message, friend. And don't stop learning. Today is the day to, to look at your calendar and, and ask the question, what part of my day is earmarked, is dialed in for discovery, for learning better ways from others, how I can be more effective, how this business could be more effective how my life could be more effective as a leader. This doesn't have to be in the business realm. This could be in the personal realm, in your family, your family leadership. Boy, if I had a guidebook on parenting when I was a new parent, and I know there's a lot of them out there, but I didn't think so much about uh, books and resources and learning from others. I just dove in. So to sit at the feet of, of another parent who has successfully raised some kids. And of course, even if you're a great parent, sometimes kids don't always go the direction you desire and that's okay. Uh, there, things can change even then. I mean, I was, a, I was a terrible teen. I was wayward and getting into all kinds of trouble. But then later I matured and I found a new path. Of course, if you've listened to the show, you've heard about my, a little bit about my faith journey and following the path of faith which has made my life tremendously better. I'd probably be in jail or dead right now had it not been for that case. And that's not just uh, hyperbole. It's the truth. But that's back to the learning, back to the education, back to standing and sitting at the feet of someone who has gone where you desire to be. So glad you joined me, my friend, at this episode. Make it a great one.